Welcome back. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, episode 23, Into the Forest. Last time, we left off with dark foreboding as our heroes departed Hastinapur, having been deprived of their kingdom, their riches, and their honor. By agreeing to summon his nephews back for a final winner-take-all dice match, blind King Dhritarashtra managed to satisfy his wicked son while deferring the price to be paid for 13 years. Since the eldest Pandava, Yudhishthira, would never think of reneging on a deal, and his younger brothers would never abandon him, there was nothing to be done except head out to the forest and serve out their term. Their departure was not a peaceful affair, however. Dreadful omens were seen, and the brothers made clear their determination to see justice done. To underscore the fact that the Karava's victory was only a temporary affair, the sage Narada himself made an angry appearance at the court, only staying long enough to predict their doom in thirteen years' time. Narada's prophecies were not taken lightly. Terrified, Duryodhana lost his nerve. He and his cronies, Karna and Shakuni, ran to Guru Drona to protect them. Duryodhana was ready to hand over all his ill-gained possessions if only Drona could protect them from the anger of their bereaved cousins. Drona promised to do what he could, assuring them that the Pandavas would surely live out their term in the forest. But, after living twelve years as Brahmacharyan, not even he could hope to defeat them. Furthermore, he reminded them that he had once taken away half the kingdom of Panchala, and that Draupadi's brother had specifically been born or created to kill Drona. Drona would do his best, but he didn't stand much of a chance. Drona's advice was for the conspirators to live it up, enjoy the riches while it lasted, because in 13 years' time, it will all be over. As for King Dhritarashtra, he was miserable. His charioteer Sanjay was puzzled. He asked the king, now that you have won everything, why are you still unhappy? The king asked, so you think there's nothing to worry about when you have made enemies of the Pandavas and their allies? Sanjay pointed out, this was all you're doing, king. You were warned not to offend your nephews, yet you indulged your foolish son, and this feud will end with the destruction of everyone. The king lamented, when the gods turn against you, the first thing they do is take away your wits. When destruction is imminent, your mind gets clouded, and what seems like the right thing turns out to be the wrong one. Vidor warned me not to make enemies of them, but I didn't listen, because I wanted to please my son. Thus ends Book 2 of the Mahabharata, called The Book of the Assembly Hall. What follows comes from the third book, called The Book of the Forest. Book 3 opens with a street scene, as the Pandavas were leaving Hastinapur for their forest banishment. The townspeople were apparently fed up with the shenanigans going on at court. They seditiously speculated on what kind of king Duryodhana would be. What would become of the people who were ruled by a wicked prince and cheating counselors? Following this chain of logic, the common people concluded that they would be better off in the jungle with a virtuous leader than to remain in Hastinapur with the gamblers, abusers, and cheats. Thus, while the Pandavas were heading out for the forest and making arrangements for their children to live with Krishna, a crowd of surly townspeople gathered, begging Yudhishthira to lead them all into the forest with him. I suppose, if Yudhishthira had been a politician instead of a noble, he might have offered to lead all the citizens away from Hastinapur, and thus get a little revenge on his cousins. Instead, he begged the townspeople to stay home. He pointed out that Bhishma, the king, his mother, and Vidur remained in Hastinapur. He said, If you have our well-being at heart, you must, all of you, protect them with your best effort, for they are anguished by grief and sorrow. That is the task that lies highest in my heart and with that you will content me fully and pay me homage. It is unclear at this point which direction the Pandavas went when they left Hastinapur, but we are told that they rode the chariots for the rest of the day and made camp on the banks of the Ganga. As evening came, a group of Brahmins caught up with them. They had followed the Pandavas out from Hastinapur. When the Brahmins presented themselves to the king and told him that they were ready to go into the forest with him, Yudhishthira said, We have been robbed of our kingdom and robbed of our wealth. We are about to enter the forest and live on fruit, roots, and meat. The wilderness is full of predators and snakes. There will be great hardship for you there, and I will not be able to protect you. That would pain me greatly. But the Brahmins insisted, saying that they will fend for themselves and bring good luck for the Pandavas with their sacrifices. One of the wise Brahmins, named Shanaka, then spoke up and gave a lecture on attachment, wealth, and suffering. The Brahmins said love and attachment are the source of all misery. He argued that the rich are not happier than anyone else, and that pursuing wealth meant they were not pursuing righteousness. The Brahmin suggested that it was better to find contentment than to retrieve his kingdom. He concluded, saying, Yudhishthira have no desire for riches. 
If you want to act in accordance with Dharma, stay clear of a longing for riches. Obviously, Yudhishthira wasn't ready to renounce his future claims to his kingdom, so he argued with Shanaka. So he argued with Shanaka, saying, I don't pursue wealth as an end in itself, but I have a duty to feed my family, support the Brahmins, and feed the poor. These were mere excuses as far as Shanaka was concerned. He said, Alas, the world has been overturned. When a person's mind is directed toward the objects of the senses, desire springs up in him. Even the man who's alert is seduced by his rapacious senses. Then, pierced by desire, he falls into the fire of greed. At last, he drowns in this madness and does not know himself. Thus, he commits himself to life after life, lost in ignorance. Shanaka then began a lecture on the true path to salvation. In an oddly Buddhist vein, he even presented it in terms of an eightfold path, which, of course, was quite different from the Buddhist list. The Brahmin's eight items consisted of oblation, Vedic study, gifts, austerity, truthfulness, forbearance, self-control, and greedlessness. Interestingly, Shanaka then ticked off a second list of eight, which sound even more Buddhist. Correct intention, correct subdual of the senses, correct and precise vows, correct service to elders, correct apportionment of food, correct learning, correct renunciation of rites, and correct suspension of thoughts. Unlike Buddhist thinking, however, Sharnaka's teaching did not aspire to nirvana. Instead, he pointed to the deities as the liberated souls one might hope to emulate. Sharnaka concluded his lecture, saying to Yudhishthira, You have found the success one acquires by having a father and mother, and the success acquired by rights. Now seek success by austerities, for once you have succeeded by austerities, you will be like a god and do what you wish. I imagine getting lectured by sadhus telling you to renounce your wealth was an occupational hazard for ancient Indian kings. Yudhishthira surely had heard all this before, so he gave up the argument with Shanaka and turned to his loyal priest Dhamya for advice. Clearly, Shanaka was not going to help him fulfill his dharma and feed the Brahmins, so Yudhishthira asked Dhamya what to do. Clearly, if you're going to live in the jungle, you should bring along a good priest, because Dhamya had just the fix. Dhamya explained that all our sustenance comes ultimately from Surya, the sun. It so happened that Dhamya had learned the 108 names for Surya, and he instructed Yudhishthira to practice yoga, meditate, and recite the names of the sun god. Having completed his austerities, the sun god appeared and promised to feed them all with forest fare for the next 12 years. Yudhishthira then went to the commissary and came out with sufficient food to feed all the Brahmins, then his brothers, then himself, and finally Draupadi. As the author said, quote, So it befell that the prince, brilliant like the sun, obtained from the sun this boon and gave the Brahmins what their hearts desired. Having worked out that this traveling party would consist of the Pandavas, Draupadi, and a gaggle of Brahmins, and then worked out a means of feeding them all, the group was led by the priest Damya to the Kamyaka forest. We are told that the journey to the Kanyaka forest led them through the field of the Kurus, Kurukshetra, and then across the Yamna River, and then on to the Sarasvati River. They made their camp at the banks of the Sarasvati on the verge of the Kanyaka forest. We'll leave our heroes settled in the forest for now. I find it interesting how the journey into exile included just the five brothers and their primary wife and a growing mob of Brahmins. Remember, there are a couple of other wives and six or seven sons who did not go into the forest. So far, we have not been told where the wives and kids went either. We'll at least find out more about them later. It was also interesting how this obscure Brahmin Shonaka had the temerity to advise the king that he should give up all his ambitions and dependence and live a life of austerity. And he gave his sermon in terms of an oddly Buddhist eightfold path. Yudhishthira politely heard the guy out, but then diplomatically turned to his pet priest Dhamya to get more practical advice. <laughs> 